Up next on Book TV, Norman Finkelstein discusses his newest book, Old Wine, Broken Bottle, Ari Shavit's Promised Land. It's a critique of Haaretz correspondent Ari Shavit's best-selling book, My Promised Land, The Triumph and Tragedy of Israel. You can watch Mr. Shavit talking about his book on our website, booktv.org. Mr. Finkelstein spoke at Red Emma's bookstore in Baltimore. This is just under two hours. Uh, well, thank you for inviting me, and I want to use the time that's allotted me. Uh, is it fair to say I can go on for roughly an hour? Is that okay? I'm not sure who the organizers are. Okay. So I want to use the time that's allotted me <clears throat> uh, to try to clarify exactly what's going on. And in this particular case, uh, it does require a certain amount of clarity because virtually everything that's being said about the current round of Israelis, Israel's massacre in Gaza, uh, virtually everything that's being said is simply not true. Saying it's not true is just the euphemism for saying it's a lie. <clears throat> and uh, I think it is important to have some clarity on what actually is happening, what triggered it, uh, what's happening now on the ground, and where things are headed. So let me begin with the beginning, namely <clears throat> the context of what's happening. And it's important to get the point of departure right because we have to know what was the cause and what was the effect. We're told that the cause was the kidnapping and then killing of the three Israeli teenagers and the effect was uh, Israel's um, harsh reaction in the West Bank. That's the sequence. Virtually every account begins by saying it all started with Israel's, <clears throat> excuse me, with the abduction and then killing of the three Israeli teenagers. Uh, but that's flat out false. Uh, the only proper context for understanding what happened is it began in April 2014 when Hamas and the Palestinian Authority, or Fatah, uh, they formed a unity government. Well, after they formed the unity government, Prime Minister Netanyahu of Israel, he demanded that the United States and the EU, EU break off relations with this new government because Hamas was a terrorist organization. Surprisingly, the United States and the EU <clears throat> said they would proceed to negotiate to work with the new government and then would decide on a step-by-step -step basis whether or not to persist in this relationship. At this point, Netanyahu was enraged. He was being consistently ignored, first on the question of Iran, when he claimed that Iran was on the verge of becoming a nuclear power and that Iran was threatening a second holocaust against Israel, the United States and the EU persisted in its negotiations with Iran. And now on his home ground, on the question of Israel and Palestine, once again he was being ignored. He was saying Hamas is a terrorist organization, you have to break off relations with it, both the EU and the US said, no, we're going to continue in our relations. In fact, when the gift fell into Netanyahu's lap, the gift being the abduction and the killing of the three teenagers, but initially the abduction, even after that gift fell into Netanyahu's lap, the US continued to say, we are not going to break off relations with the new unity government. Well, now Netanyahu had a pretext. He knew full well from day one that number one, the kids were dead, and number two, Hamas had nothing to do with it. But he saw an opportunity. The opportunity was to exploit the abduction and killing of the three Israeli teenagers to do what Israel always does. When Israel wants to break off what Israelis call a peace offensive, 
these nasty Palestinian peace offensives because now Hamas had signed on into the unity government and the unity government had said because Prime Minister Abbas was the spokesperson still of the unity government he said that we are accepting as the unity government we are accepting the EU-US terms for negotiations the terms were number one uh, renunciation of violence number two recognition of the state of Israel uh, and number three it just slips my mind it'll come back to me in a moment um, the um, Hamas had joined a government which accepted oh recognition of all past agreements so it was renunciation of violence recognition of all past agreements and recognition of the state of Israel Hamas said the new unit excuse me Abbas said the new unit unity government accepts those terms Hamas had joined the new unity government and then by inference Hamas was accepting the terms of the EU and the US so Netanyahu has a big problem on his hands it's one of those periodic Palestinian peace offensives and as Israel always does and it's not peculiar to Prime Minister Netanyahu it's typical of the Israeli government whenever you have to deal confront one of these peace offensives the way you try to deflect the peace offensive is you start pounding and pounding and pounding the, the presenters of the peace offensive until they react violently and so now Netanyahu had his pretext the abduction and killing of the three kids he then started going after Hamas in the West Bank arrested about 700 Palestinians I guess about the majority of them being Hamas ransacking homes demolishing two homes and carrying on as it always does at these moments like a hooligan state carrying on these rampages until until Hamas finally reacts and when it finally reacts as it did as anyone would under those circumstances what does Netanyahu say look you see I told you they're terrorists you can't negotiate with them in fact this is a particularly odd situation because in fact it was not a Palestinian peace offensive ironically this was a Palestinian surrender offensive Prime Minister Abbas of the Palestinian Authority he accepted Secretary, all of Secretary of State's conditions for ending the conflict during the negotiations that were carried on what was called the Kerry Initiative or the Kerry process Abbas accepted that Israel could annex the major settlement blocks Abbas accepted the nullification of the right of return it's perfectly clear from the record or what's been leaked from the record he accepted everything he accepted a defeat but Prime Minister Netanyahu because of coalition politics he wouldn't even accept a surrender from the Palestinians and so now he was determined to wreck the unity government so at some point in the future he wouldn't have to accept not a settlement based on international law because at some point in the future he wouldn't have to accept a surrender from the Palestinians well after the rampage in the West Bank it gradually escalated and at some point 
it turned into the ground invasion. I made many predictions along the way before the whole conflict started, the current round, about what would happen. And many people will no doubt recall that one of my predictions was I thought it was impossible that Israel would be able to repeat what it did during Operation Cast Lead in 2008-9. That the international community had drawn a red line. The red line had a name, it was called the Goldstone Report. Even though the report of Richard Goldstone was eventually ignored, it set up a new standard. The standard was to Israel, no, you can't do that sort of stuff anymore. You went too far. And for a long time, my prediction held up. In November 2012, Israel launched Operation Pillar of Defense, a, we would call it a, a, a lesser massacre in Gaza. But that was a very different attack than 2008-9. For those of you who recall, during Operation Pillar of Defense in 2000, excuse me, in 2012, November 2012, they didn't target schools, they didn't target mosques, uh, and the death toll was significantly different. It was about 170 people. Operation Cast Lead, it was 1,400. So up until that point, what I predicted turned out to be right. However, it's perfectly obvious now that I'm way off base in terms of the new massacre in Gaza. It's more or less on the same magnitude as 2008-9. I know people have said it's much worse. Uh, my guess is I haven't yet seen, the dust hasn't settled, so I don't know what the final reckoning will be. But roughly speaking, it seems pretty much at this point, and we can make perfect comparisons because Operation Cast Lead lasted 22 days and Operation Protective Edge now, I think it's the 22nd or 23rd day, if I'm correct. Is that right? I think it's 23rd, yeah, that's what I thought. Uh, Operation Cast Lead, it was about 1,400 people killed, about 1,200 were civilians, now it's probably around 1,200 killed, again about 80% civilians. It's roughly the same the targeting, not only the targeting of hospitals, the targeting of the same hospitals, uh, Al-Wafa, Al-Shifa, it's the same thing all over again. And now the question is, why was I so off base? And I'm not trying to defend myself, I'm trying to understand the situation, which is what we should try to do in order to enable us to accurately predict where things are heading. Politics can at best be, political analysis can at best be about trajectories, where things are generally headed. But politics itself is about taking advantage of opportunities, being skillful at exploiting the moment. And I mentioned gift number one that fell into Netanyahu's lap, the abduction and killing of the three teenagers, and then two new gifts fell into Netanyahu's lap. Gift number one was the vampire Tony Blair. Tony Blair, he's a clever politician and a vampire, and the two obviously aren't mutually exclusive. Uh, he's also a high-priced call girl, and those three are not mutually exclusive. Uh, Tony Blair, he dreamt up something clever. He said, let's come up with a ceasefire proposal which Hamas has to reject. And he comes up with this proposal. He hands it to uh, that monstrosity, uh, President Sisi. It's now called the Egyptian Initiative. As if Sisi can even spell initiative. The Egypt, it was Tony Blair, and the initiative was quite clever. We're going to have a ceasefire, he said. And then he says, 
We'll lift the blockade. Well, that sounds reasonable, ceasefire in exchange for lifting the blockade. That's what Hamas wants. But the language was very clever. We'll lift the blockade when the security situation stabilizes in Gaza. We'll lift the blockade when the security situation stabilizes in Gaza. Well, according to Israel, Hamas is a terrorist organization. So by definition, the security situation in Gaza can't stabilize until Hamas is disarmed. So in effect, Tony Blair's ceasefire was an ultimatum to Hamas. We'll lift the blockade if you disarm. If you don't disarm, then we're not lifting the blockade. Of course, of course Hamas had to reject those terms. That was gift number one. So now the whole world can be told that Prince of Peace, President, uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu, he wanted a ceasefire. It was Hamas that said no. And then gift number two was the downing of the Malaysian airliner. When the Malaysian airliner was downed, Gaza immediately was replaced in the top headlines by what happened to the airliner. And as I said, Netanyahu, uh, he's not, he's a, He's not genius, but he's obviously a competent politician. And it was perfectly obvious what was going to happen then. In 1989, way before many of you in this room were born, lucky you, in 1989, there was the first intifada. And during the first intifada, which was giving Israel a very hard time, there was the Tiananmen massacre in China. And Netanyahu back then, he's been around a while, as have I, <laughs> Netanyahu gave a famous speech at Bar Ilan E University, and he said Israel's big mistake was it didn't take advantage of the Tiananmen massacre to carry out a mass expulsion in the occupied Palestinian territories. So you know this guy knows how to connect unpredictable events with political initiative. That's politics. When the Malaysian airliner was downed, he saw the oppor opportunity between the fake claim that Hamas had rejected a reasonable ceasefire and the Malaysian airliner downing, he now had the pretext to launch the ground invasion. Before I get to what happened after, I want to dispose of all of the nonsense that's been said about Hamas rockets, the miracle of Iron Dome, and now the tunnels that they have discovered in Gaza. Let's start with the first. Does Hamas have rockets? Now, when I conjure up in my mind a rocket, I conjure up something pretty tall, pretty impressive, and pretty destructive. That's a rocket in my mind. Maybe I have a quaint imagination, but that's what I see. So now let's use some simple, common sense. Gaza has been under an airtight blockade for seven years. Israel doesn't let anything into Gaza that can be remotely used for military purposes. That's fact number one. Now some of you are thinking, aha, he's deceiving us. What about those tunnels that Hamas has built or dug between Egypt and Gaza? Fair enough, it was a sophisticated tunnel economy and probably military or military, militarily related material was smuggled in. I don't doubt that. I have no problem with that. 
But then, whatever they manage to smuggle in, whatever they manage to smuggle in, they exhausted in November 2012 during Operation Pillar of Defense. Operation Pillar of Defense ends at the end of November. Seven months later is the coup in Egypt. The first thing CC did after the coup was blow up all the tunnels. He blew up the estimate about 95% of the tunnels. Nothing could get into Gaza. Nothing for the last year. So, where did these rockets come from? Where was the material to make them? As now is freely admitted, all of these rockets were homemade by Hamas with barely any materials. The reason these Hamas rockets have caused all of three Israeli casualties, civilian casualties, all of three Israeli civilian casualties, it's because they're not rockets. They're closer to firecrackers than rockets. Now, some of you may say, aha, Finkelstein is deceiving us again because we all know that miracle, that miracle of miracles, Iron Dome. These are very efficient rockets, but that miracle of miracles, Iron Dome, managed to knock them out of the sky. Okay, what's the facts behind that? Number one, the top person in the world in this particular area of research is Theodore Postel at MIT. Postel was the first person to expose the nonsense about uh, the Patriot anti-missile system during the 1991 uh, so-called, uh, you know, the first Gulf War. At the time, they were saying the Patriot anti-missile system was 80%, 90% effective, for those of you who remember. What did it turn out? It turned out that maybe, maybe, one Scud missile was deflected by the Patriot anti-missile defense system. And that was revealed about a, a year or two after the first Gulf War by Theodore Postel. Well, Postel was then asked recently in the last month, the last, no, it has to be the last two weeks, he was asked, well, what about Iron Dome? What is its efficiency? He put its efficiency, I'm quoting him, at 5%. 5%. It's not Iron Dome that's deflecting these humongous rockets. What's deflecting them is they're not rockets in the first place. Now, how do we know that? There's such a simple way to know that. If you use your brain for half a minute, just use your brain. Operation Cast Lead, 2008 to 9. It lasted 22 days. How many civilian casualties were there in Israel? Does anyone know? There were three. Operation Protective Edge. It's lasted now 22 days. How many civilian casualties in Israel? Three. Operation Cast Lead before Iron Dome. Operation Protective Edge after the Iron Dome. What's the rational conclusion? Iron Dome did zilch. That's the rational conclusion. In fact, the rockets now being used, now being used by Hamas, are much more primitive than the ones they used in 2008-9 because at that point they had managed to smuggle something in. Now it's nothing. 
Well, now Mr. Netanyahu has a problem. He boasted so much about the efficiency of Iron Dome, this miracle of miracles, that the only conclusion you could draw of it's so efficient, this work of genius by the geniuses of all geniuses, the Israelis, only they could come up with such a brilliant contraption. If it's so efficient, then why are you killing all these Gazans? If it's so efficient, none of your civilians are being killed save three, then why do you have to carry on like maniacs and lunatics in Gaza? So he has a problem. And he comes up with a new pretext. That's why the New York Times has people like Isabel Kirshner. She's there to just copy out anything the New York Times hands her. Excuse me, anything that the Israeli consulate has her. And even there, the difference is only a fleece hop. Uh, so what did they do? They come up with a new idea. The reason we're attacking Gaza, because the rockets, so to speak, don't fly anymore. The reason we're attacking Ham uh, Gaza is because of the tunnels. And day in and day out, they keep saying this whole operation is because of the tunnels. And that's supposed to explain to rational people why Israel is doing what it's doing. It's not the rockets anymore, it's the tunnels. So, when an Israeli naval vessel kills four kids on the beach playing soccer, it's because of the tunnels. And when Israel targets Al Wafa Hospital, why? It's because of the tunnels. Even though nobody even claimed there were tunnels underneath the hospital. And when Israel targeted Al Shifa Hospital and also targeted the playground nearby, well, it's obvious why they did that. It's the tunnels. And day in and day out, you keep hearing about the tunnels, as if the tunnels can in any way rationally explain why Israel's precision weapons are constantly killing kids and targeting manifestly civilian sites. Well, you could say Israel is doing it, since it's obviously not the tunnels. You could say Israel is doing it because it's a lunatic state. It's a state that's gone over the cliff. And I myself have to acknowledge that on more than one occasion I've said as much. I think it's a crazy state. It's not a failed state. It's a crazy state. But there's a, still, to use the Shakespearean expression, there is a method in the madness. And it's not difficult to discern. Number one, when Israel launched Operation Cast Lead in 2008-9, the orders that were given to the Israeli combat forces, the orders were blast everything in sight because we don't want combatant casualties. Israel is in many ways a reverse of conventional societies. In most societies, they tolerate combatant casualties much more than they're willing to tolerate civilian casualties. Israel is a different kind of society. It's a kind of Spartan society in which military or combatant casualties are a source of much greater anguish and torment than civilian casualties. So the first rule is combatants aren't supposed to get killed. 
And so in Operation Cast Lead in 2008-9, if you read the orders that were given, a lot of it was published, it was if you see a building in the distance, you don't ask any questions. You demolish everything in sight, so there will be nobody to even take a, uh, a sniper shot at you. So one of the reasons was uh, to demolish everything in sight, and that can explain some of what Israel has been doing now. So in Shujaya, the big massacre, the biggest massacre to date, in Shujaya, uh, it was freely admitted. They said, we leveled the place because if we had to go in street by street fighting with the Hamas militants, we would have had to absorb a large number of combatant casualties. And so they wiped the whole place out. It wasn't only because of that. Uh, the other reason was the day before, seven Israeli uh, soldiers had been killed, and it became a kind of revenge operation that partly explained it. But that's not the larger part of the explanation, because contrary to what you might conceive, there hasn't been a ground invasion. It's not true. There has been an occupation a couple of miles into the border. It's only on the border area for the reason I mentioned to you already. There was and is a fear that if they were to conduct a real ground invasion deep into Gaza, they were going to, they are, because they still might, but at this point, there's the fear that they will suffer some uh, significant combat losses. And so they're holding back. They're still at the border. So if they're still at the border, and it's not to protect combatants, why are they doing it? Why have they seemingly gone mad? And there the reason has been completely acknowledged by Israelis if you read it. Number one, it won't surprise anyone in this room, they're hoping that a terror bombing, that a terror bombing will bring Palestinians and Gazans, Palestinian Gazans to their knees. They're hoping that you'll destroy everything in sight, there's a humanitarian ceasefire, the people come out, they see there is nothing, and then they say, then let's have a ceasefire and let's end it, because the devastation is so terrible. And the longer term goal is they hope that with all the death and destruction, people will eventually blame Hamas for what happened and will then seek to unseat Hamas. And in fact, that was the calculation during Operation Cast Lead as well. And there was some truth to it. The people of Gaza stood behind the resistance in 2008-9 but then a significant element of alienation entered when the Gazans, people of Gaza asked themselves, for what? All of this death, Israel left behind 600,000 tons of rubble after Operation Cast Lead. All of the death, all of the destruction, the blockade was still there. So there was a feeling of Hamas got in, us into a mess. I don't think that's accurate, but that's what Israel's hoping will again happen this time. That's the purpose behind the terror bombing. And we should be clear about one point. There should be no doubt on one critical point. A couple of days ago, I got so just, I couldn't take it anymore. 20 days in front of the computer watching this thing unfold, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, you begin to go mad. And um, my friend Sarah Roy, some of you may know her from Harvard, who lived in Gaza, knows the people, and has a heart. She's a very decent human being. She sent an email to me, not to me personally, to her people, describing the attack on the playground, another kid just blown to fragments. 
And Sarah is a very smart person, and she's an elegant person. She's a distinguished scholar, comes from a impressive family. Her mother was a survivor of Auschwitz. And then the last line in the email said, I want to vomit. I want to vomit. And that just struck a chord with me. No fancy language, no rhetorical curlicues. I want to vomit. By the way, Israel is carrying on in Gaza. So I decided it was time to do something. I can't justify in my own mind just sitting in front of a computer. So I decided, okay, let's organize some sitting, get arrested. I don't know what I'll do, but I want to do something. And so I said, let's do it in front of the Israeli consulate, Israeli mission to the UN. And after I announced it, I went to bed, and I'm thinking in my bed, you know, Norm, you kind of made an error here. Why are you attacking the US mission? Excuse me, why are you attacking the Israeli mission? Who was the enabler? Who allowed it to happen? Every day, every day that that pedantic, pontificating, insipid president Every day, no, it's a fact. Let's not kid ourselves. Every single day that that man came out and said, Israel has the right to defend itself, each time he said it, he was giving Israel the green light to continue the massacre. That's a fact. Were it not for him, that could not have happened. And it's a very odd thing. There are people here, not many, but there are people here whose memories go back to 1982, the Israeli massacre in Lebanon then. How many people remember it? Raise your hand. Okay, some. It's a very strange thing, but facts are facts, and we have to acknowledge them. During the Israeli massacre in Lebanon in 1982, and that was quite a shindig, Israel killed between 15 and 20,000 Palestinian and Lebanese, overwhelmingly civilians, in those three and a half months. But during the massacre, at one point, President Reagan, that brain-dead monster, President Reagan, at one point, he had this picture of a child. How many people remember? A child who was a victim of the Israeli attack in Lebanon. And he took the picture of the child who had been severely targeted, severely burnt, and put it on his desk. And then the prime minister at the time, Menachem Begin, he embarked on one of his lunatic jihads. He was going to prove that child was not targeted by Israel. And so a kind of little war of, of images, whatever you want to call it in a stupid postmodern language, a war of narratives, whatever that means, uh, went on between Be uh, Prime Minister Begin and President Reagan. But the fact of the matter is, if we want to be truthful to ourselves, Ronald Reagan showed more heart than Barack Obama to what's happening in Gaza. Well, how is it going to end? There is an end game, and right now there are two contending parties. Hamas's position is clear. We want a ceasefire and the lifting of the blockade. The Israeli-American EU position is also clear. It's going, they want ceasefire, lifting the blockade, and disarming Hamas. And that's where we now stand. It's a kind of stalemate. And so the most important thing at this point is to prepare for that kind of public battle. So let's ask the obvious questions. Number one. Must Hamas be disarmed? 
So, Netanyahu shows the world Hamas terrorist organization. Look what it did. Look how horrible it is. And so everybody nods their head in agreement. Of course, as one condition for ending the hostilities, Hamas has to be disarmed. But there's one problem with that narrative. I hate that word. Uh, as if there is a Nazi narrative of the Holocaust and a Jewish narrative. It's so stupid. The sort of things academics dream up, it's really embarrassing. <laughs> Even though the whole profession is an embarrassment, so you can't... Uh, so, must Hamas be disarmed? Okay, it's true, I'm an ex-academic, so I could say... <laughs> I know what you're whispering. <laughs> He's envious. Yeah. It's Nietzsche's resentiment. Okay. <laughs> the people who are laughing are trying to impress you that they've read Nietzsche. Okay. <laughs> so, the first obvious question is, who started the hostilities? In 2008-9, in Operation Cast Lead. There was a ceasefire in June. If you look even at the Israeli Terrorism Center publications, I'm quoting it now, they said, quote, Hamas was careful, Hamas was careful to respect the ceasefire. How did the ceasefire end? Everybody knows on November 4th, election day in the United States, when attention was riveted to the U.S. presidential election with Barack Obama, the Israelis, who, as I said, are very competent in taking advantage of uh, gifts. Uh, on November 4th, 2008, Israel invaded Gaza, killed six Palestinian militants from Hamas, and that's when the whole thing started to fall apart. It was Israel that broke the ceasefire. That ceasefire agreement said in 2008-9, excuse me, in June 2008, that ceasefire said the blockade was supposed to be lifted. Was it lifted? No, Israel tightened the blockade. So, in the first massacre, who initiated the conflict? Israel broke the ceasefire. Israel didn't abide by the conditions of the ceasefire. So, a rational person concludes it's Israel that should be disarmed. It broke the ceasefire. It violated the conditions of the ceasefire. 2012 November, it ends with a ceasefire agreement. Ceasefire agreement says the blockade of Gaza is supposed to be lifted. Was the blockade of Gaza lifted? No, in fact, it was tightened because beyond the blockade, then all the tunnels were blown up, and it was worse. In the last round, who broke the ceasefire? There was virtually no rocket attacks coming from Gaza after the 2012 ceasefire agreement. It all began to escalate when Netanyahu tried to violate, excuse me, tried to provoke a Hamas reaction to break up the unity government. So, rationally speaking, if any side is supposed to disarm, it should be Israel that dis should be disarmed. What does international law say? The law is so clear. There have been enough textbooks written in international law on the topic to fill this room. The law is, under international law, a people struggling for self-determination has the right to use armed force to achieve its end. That's the law. Some people say the law is neutral. Okay, fair. You can make that argument. People like James Crawford at Oxford. Okay, fair enough. But nobody says, and I've read the whole literature on the topic, nobody says that a people struggling for self-determination do not have the right to use armed force to achieve their goals. Nobody says that's the law. 
On the other hand, international law is clear. It says a power that's trying to suppress a self-determination struggle, it doesn't have the right to use force. A self-determination struggle is the most basic right under international law, the right to self-determination and statehood. If you're carrying on a struggle for self-determination and statehood, no power has the right to suppress that uh, self-determination struggle. So again, on the basis of the law, if any side should be disarmed, if any side should be disarmed, it's Israel. It's not Hamas. That's the law. Israel says it's defending itself, has the right to defend itself. And that's true under international law. Uh, there are all sorts of caveats, qualifications, no point in going to them, but everybody understands it's commonsensical. A country under armed attack has the right to defend itself. I'm not going to go into the qualifications now. But the question is very simple. Is Israel defending itself? Is it trying to defend itself? Or is it trying to maintain the occupation? And those are two very different things. The most basic fact about an occupation under international law, the most basic fact about an occupation under international law, the most basic fact is occupations are supposed to end. That's what makes an occupation an occupation. Occupations are supposed to end. It's 47 years since Israel occupied the West Bank, Gaza, and East Jerusalem. One thing we can conclude with virtually scientific precision, Israel has no intention of ending the occupation. In fact, it is so determined not to end the occupation that it turned down a Palestinian surrender. Now, an occupation that goes on through eternity is not an occupation. That is an annexation. And annexations are illegal under international law. When Israel says it wants to defend itself and it demands of Hamas that it disarm, what Israel is really saying is it demands the right to maintain the occupation. It demands the right, it demands of Hamas that it cease resisting the occupation. That's what they're really asking. They want the right to maintain through eternity the occupation. And that's twice illegal under international law. It's illegal, number one, because occupations are supposed to end. Annexations are illegal. And it's illegal, number two, because Hamas has no obligation whatsoever under international law to disarm until Israel ends its occupation. As a practical matter, it's a very simple concept. Person A, let's call him, what's your name? Dan. Dan is throttling, what's your name? James, throttling is the fancy word for suffocating. <laughs> suffocating is the fancy word for choking. And if you don't know choking, you don't belong in Red Emma's. <laughs> it's a bookstore. But let's use the fancy word. Dan, Dan, is throttling James. James manages in the course of being suffocated, he manages to scratch Dan a little. Dan is now enraged. He's furious at these scratches. And so beyond 
suffocating them, then he starts to batter him, beat him, and beat him, and beat him, and beat him. And he says, it's my right of self-defense. He scratched me. It's my right of self-defense. Some people said, Dan has no choice. James is scratching him. Now anyone with a jot of common sense and decency knows full well that Dan has a choice. If he doesn't want James to s scratch him, all he has to do is to stop suffocating James. If Israel does not want to be the subject of occasional scratches, which is all that these rocket attacks come to, so-called rocket attacks, it has a very simple op option. It could stop suffocating the Palestinians. It can pack up its bags, return to its state, its country, its borders under international law, and it can finally let the Palestinians live in peace. Thank you. Okay, I have a rule. My rule is very simple. Everybody was patient, everybody was decent, uh, nobody tried to muzzle me, heckle me, and I do believe heckling is perfectly legitimate. I like the British style more than the American, but that's beside the point. Uh, but everybody was, was perfectly respectful, and I like, to be I like to reciprocate that. So I would like to take the first three questions from dissenters people who strongly disagree with me, let them go to the microphone first and give them the opportunity to speak or ask me a question. Okay, if we're not having, uh, Matt, are you gonna ask a question? Okay, go ahead. I didn't plant him. I met him earlier. <laughs> My question is very basic. What does international law say about the Palestinian right of return? Uh, I think there has to be two ways to address that question. The first is the question of what international law says about the Palestinian right of return. Um, let me try to address it fully. However, I want to enter one, it's not a weasel caveat, it's an it's a important one for me at any rate. Uh, I've been working on a book with a Palestinian uh, scholar and comrade of mine, Muin Rabani, and it's called uh, How to Solve the Israel-Palestine Conflict. And I, I've felt that there are certain issues, though we all try to be objective and we all try to be reasonable, there's a certain question here of moral authority. And for me, only a Palestinian, in my view, has the moral authority to address the question of the right of return. So I try uh, to respect that distinction. It's not a legal distinction, it's a subtle moral distinction. I think it's a proper question for a Palestinian, not myself. And so that particular chapter in the book, uh, he's accepted uh, responsibility for crafting. Having said that, what does international law say about the right of return? 
Uh, number one, obviously under international law, Palestinians have the right of return uh, and compensation, not or compensation, have the right of return and compensation. It's not my opinion, it's the opinion of all the major human rights organizations. Human Rights Watch in 2000, Amnesty International in 2001, both of them uh, published what they called position papers on the right of return. Both Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch both said that Palestinians who were expelled from their homes in 1948 and 1967, and the expression is in succeeding generations that have maintained genuine links with the land, they have their right of return. That's the legal issue. Now, there are two other issues that arise. There's number one, the question of does the right of return undergo a, a um, not a metamorphosis, a, mod a modification does it undergo a modification uh, in light of the two state, uh, the, the international consensus for two states, um, an Israeli state and a Palestinian state? Does, is there a clash between the principle of two states and the principle of the right of return? Do those two principles come into collision? And everybody knows it's often the case in the real world that two abstract principles or even legal principles can come into conflict with each other and then you have to adjudicate how to reconcile two principles that come into conflict. It's my impression from listening to uh, Moeen Rabani develop his argument, he thinks a conflict does arise. And that means you have to find some sort of modification, adjudication, reconciliation between the right of return on one hand and the principle of two states on the other. That's the first qualification. The second one is there's one thing to speak of what's legally right and there's another thing to say what's politically possible. Uh, if you look at the various documents that have been issued by various organizations and so forth, uh, currently the way the United Nations General Assembly puts it in its annual resolution, Peaceful Settlement of the Palestine Question, the way the UN, resolution puts, resolution, uh, UN General Assembly resolution puts it, they speak of a just solution of the refugee question based on UN Resolution 194, right of return and compensation. So they don't say implementation of 194, right of return and compensation. They say a just solution based on, which obviously means something less than implementation, but how much less, very hard to say. Yes, I think you should use the microphone. Thank you for the talk. Uh, my question is regarding the regional context of uh, this issue. Um, I mean, do you think that there is any influence from uh, neighboring countries in the region that this is now okay? I mean, when the Muslim Brotherhood won the elections in Egypt, the, the, the notion was that when you use democratic means to promote undemocratic methods, they were in supportive of the coup that happened with Sisi. And there is a trend now that any Islamist kind of regime is not wanted in the Arab world by Arab governments. Do you think the Arab governments have a role in what's going on in terms of supporting yeah. Israel? Well, there's no question about that. I mean, that's not even a question open to doubt. Certainly, Egypt, it's not questionable whether or not they support Hamas. That's a non-question. Uh, Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, they're all working with uh, Egypt now to crush Hamas. Uh, and a fa as a matter of fact, the, um, one of the big talking points now, uh, the big talking points is that this, uh, the Vampire Blair's ceasefire proposal that CC presented, uh, that was um, supported by the Arab League. That's a fact. And right now everybody's agreeing that the only term, everyone, including Hamas, unfortunately, because he doesn't have much of a choice at this point, are agreeing that the basic document that has to be modified or at some modified or not modified, the basic document is the Egyptian peace initiative. So everybody's accepting that that's the starting point. Uh, yeah, it's a disaster for the Palestinians. There really are, uh, this time around, they're alone.
I mean, not that the ever the Arab states ever cared, but this time it's a disaster. Yeah. So again, folks, if you have questions, there's a microphone right here. Please come and form a line, and please keep your questions brief. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you for uh, coming and speaking. Thanks for joining us at the rally earlier. Um, but I guess uh, my question sort of piggybacks off of the first question uh, in regards to the right of return uh, for Palestinian refugees. And I guess in your criticisms of BDS, uh, over the course of the last couple of years, I guess, that's been, um, you've also raised the flag of the two-state solution as being the only realistic solution. Um, and within your criticisms of BDS, you criticized them for three demands, I, I believe it was, uh, which is the right of return, uh, which aren't, I don't even know if they're officially BDS demands, but um, the right of return, uh, equal rights for Palestinians, um, and I forget Ending the third the occupation. one. And then end of the occupation. Okay, and you said that those are unrealistic and that BDS needs to be honest about their approach to it. Or Anyway, um, I, my question is, how do you see a two-state solution? While you see it as a realistic uh, solution to the crises and to the occupation and a, as a means of bringing Palestinians justice, um, I just hear separate and unequal, uh, which is what we have a very clear history of in this country. And um, how do you see a two-state solution playing out as being a just solution if Palestinians, one, will not have equal access to resources as the state of Israel is already guaranteed um, as a result of a two-state solution, and two, if there's no equal rights within the two states. So, um, I, yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, obviously, those are uh, the second question is a very large one. Uh, let me just try to address, the, excuse me, I must have, I know I did this. I'm not very tech savvy, but I know when I'm doing something really stupid, and that was really stupid. <laughs> okay. Um, I think there's a certain misunderstanding about my opinions on BDS, so let me just clarify them. And uh, you can check for yourself. I've, I think I've been pretty consistent. Of course I support boycotts, of course I support divestment, and of course I support sanctions. And I support boycotts, divestments, and sanctions long, long before uh, BDS came along. I've been involved in this now, it's 32 years, I got involved in June 1982, and I have a long, long record of being involved in various church initiatives calling for divestment. So there's no, the record is pretty clear. Uh, that of course support boycott, divestment, and sanctions. But boycott, divestment, and sanctions is something different than BDS. BDS is not just a tactic of boycott, divestment, and sanctions. BDS is a platform. And the platform begins, as everybody who's looked at the platform, what they call the 2005 BDS call. As everybody knows, the platform begins by saying that BDS is anchored in international law. That's the first thing they say. In fact, the BDS call came out in July 2005, which was one year to the day after the International Court of Justice uh, advisory opinion on the Ill illegality of the wall that Israel has been building in the West Bank. And they timed it for one year after the International Court of Justice to point up the fact that we're looking at this uh, advisory opinion of the court, the court's view, uh, the court's uh, this, uh, conclusion that the wall is illegal is not being respected, and so we are going to form this BDS campaign in order to see that the law is implemented. Okay, well I agree with BDS. The starting point for any campaign to try to change public opinion and to roll back Israel, the starting point has to be under international law. Has to be international law. No quarrel there, no dispute there. But the quarrel and dispute is, what does the international law say? The international law says, yes, Israel has to end the occupation, that's true. Israel has to um, acknowledge the Palestinian right of return, that's true. And there is basic principles of international law about equality under the law. But that's not the end of the law. The law also says Israel is a state under international law. That's the law. Now you may not like that law. And you might say, oh, the law is imperialist, capitalist, oppressive. 
uh, and all the other things. And you're certainly within your right to say that. And then you could say, I don't want to have any truck with the law. But if you start off your, uh, your, first, your first document by saying, we're anchored in international law, how can you say you're anchored in international law and then when you're asked where you stand in Israel, you say Israel, uh, BDS takes no position on Israel. How can you take no position? That's the law. Israel is a state. That's the law. It's a member state of the United Nations. It has the same rights and obligations as any other state under the law. Now, you may not like that. I said, fine. But don't claim that you're anchored in international law. For years, Israel was saying, a condition for negotiations with the Palestinians is they have to recognize Israel. And the Palestinians and their supporters said, but you want a unilateral recognition of Israel. You have to recognize us. That was the response of Palestinians. But now BDS is saying the same thing as Israel. They're saying we want our rights recognized under international law but we're agnostic, we take no position on Israeli rights. You're doing the same thing. Now that's just hypocrisy. And I'm way too old to be playing those sorts of hypocritical games. I can't do it. If you want to say you're, in the, you're for the, you want to work with the law, I think that probably is the strongest tool that Palestinians have. Uh, as Professor Edward Said said a long time ago, and many others have said, the strongest tool Palestinians have is international legitimacy, meaning the law. But international legitimacy goes both ways. That's my primary uh, disagreement with uh, the BDS, as they're well aware. Now, I'll, I'm going to let you speak, I promise. I'm not the kind of person that cuts people off. Would you rather me not address the second question, you just respond to this? Because no, no, there's a long line, so major, you, it's your choice. Would you rather respond to this or me answer the second question about the two-state solution? Well, yeah, this, so the second question, but it was just an aside that these sisters allowed me to present is um, what would be wrong with, I guess, international law aside and justice presented um, as the focal point and the arguing point position and liberation, what would be wrong with a one Palestinian state with equal rights for all citizens within that Palestinian state? Historical Palestine as it existed before 1947. Look, there's nothing wrong with it, and I think it's a fine idea. I also think it's a fine idea that 30 million Mexicans now live, uh, 30, 30 million citizens of the United States are of Mexican origin. Half of uh, the entire Mexican economy, a large chunk of it, is dependent on remittances from Mexicans living in the United States. We stole, it's not a, that's, you know, you'll find the books here, we, <laughs> we stole half of Mexico. So I think it's a fine idea and certainly rises to the standard of justice. It's a fine idea if we eliminate the border between the United States and Mexico. That's also a fine idea. <laughs> it's also justice. But then we have to ask ourselves, politically, does it have any possibility? There's a serious issue on our border. Several hundred Mexicans are killed each year trying to enter the country. There's also a serious issue here of undocumented Mexicans. And there's talk about what's called immigration reform. Does anybody talk about eliminating the border? One state? Well, the answer is obviously not. It has no, ch it's, it's politically, it's just beside the point. We're not talking about justice in the abstract. We're talking about what's politically possible. And there's no basis whatsoever in the real world. There's exactly zero support in the real world for a one-state resolution of the conflict. Let's start with basics. Can anyone in this room name me one state, one state in the world that supports 
one state in Palestine. Don't name Iran. No, you don't name Iran because every year Iran votes in the UN along with the rest of the world for two states. Iran is a uh, member of the um, Islamic, the, uh, the Organization of Islamic Cooperation. It's 57 Islamic countries. Iran is a member. Amer Iran is a member of the Organization of Islamic Countries, endorsed the two-state settlement. There's no support for it. So what are you talking about? I'm not averse to the idea. I think it's a fine idea. I'm like Rodney King, for those of you young and old enough to remember. Uh, why can't people get along? Yeah, I believe that. I believe people can get along. But that's a personal belief. It has nothing to do with politics. And I think one of the problems often afflicting the Palestine question is that people confuse their own personal concepts and senses of justice with uh, what's politically possible in terms of justice. You can make any kind of, you can, of course, as a personal belief, you're allowed to harbor anything. But it's, you have to then assess what politically is realistic and possible. Now, I know the obvious answer is, the obvious answer to what I'm saying, or some of you are thinking is, well, the two-state settlement, that's not realistic and possible anymore. Israel will never accept the two-state settlement. That's the standard argument. But there's just such an obvious answer crying to be said. If Israel will not accept a full withdrawal from the territories it occupied in June 1967, if that's true, is there anyone here in the room who could possibly believe that they would be more willing to dismantle Israel than to withdraw? Does that make any sense? That Israel would be more willing to dismantle itself than to withdraw from the territories it occupied. So when people say the two-state settlement is dead and therefore the only other possibility is the one state, the, uh, the obvious rational answer is, if two states is dead, then one state is twice as dead. Yes? So my question relates, you mentioned earlier the um, idea of a conflict of narratives. Um, and I think what a lot of us find frustrating with this conflict is the fact that with social media, we see a lot of what's going on in Gaza um, at the ground level but we see a very different narrative portrayed in the media and through our government. Um, how do you see, um, with the rest of this conflict, that playing out and um, really what might happen from a ground level in changing that narrative and making them more equal? Well, first of all, I, I say, uh, it's famously said of one Nazi that whenever he hears the word, uh, it's said of him that he said, whenever he hears the word culture, he reaches, he reaches for a gun. Uh, I feel the same way about narratives. Whenever there are not two narratives, somebody is lying. You know, it's very different. And if uh, if Israel said it was Hamas rockets that fell in the UNRWA school, or the UNRWA school was empty, and the rest of the world, bear in mind, every time the pair the the uh, media says, but Palestinians say, that's a complete and total lie. It's not Palestinians saying it. It's every human rights organization that's saying it. They say, Israelis say, the Palestinians are using human shields. Palestinians say, it's not true. And so the reader is supposed to throw up his or her hands in despair. Who's telling the truth? But it's not Palestinians that are saying that Palestinians are not human, using human shields. Amnesty International said this past week, Palestinians are not using human shields. Human Rights Watch, no friend of Palestinians said Palestinians 
are not using human shields. Jeremy Bowen, the Middle East editor for BBC, also not a friend of Israel, he said no evidence that Palestinians are using human shields. So this is not two narratives. It's one side is lying and the other side isn't. Now, now, how successful has this war between not competing narratives but between truth and lies been? I have to say, being somewhat old-fashioned, I never look at anything on the web except my email. But I'm told that Israel is uh, having a very hard time on the web now, that the social media, uh, it's been a massacre of Israel, even though that's certainly metaphorical, unlike what's happening in Gaza, which is literal. Uh, so I think it's been a very powerful, uh, a, a very important arena of conflict. And I think the people who are on the social media doing battle, I think they're doing something important. And the reason I conclude that is Israel has invested a huge amount of financial and human resources to trying to win the battle on the social media. Because Israelis are an integral part of the, at any rate, Western world. They do care about their image. They don't like to be looked upon as child killers. That's not the way they want to be perceived. And so, as everybody in this room knows, it's now said that Israel is paying people uh, to go on the web, to tweet in favor of Israel. Uh, they're losing very badly, and I think that's an important uh, arena, and people I certainly think uh, should continue to do that. Uh, it's been, I'm not sure if this will be as significant a turning point as 2008-9, but it will be, I think it will be significant. Uh, as some of you may have noticed, there was an article a couple of days ago in Haaretz in which uh, a, a journalist commented that exactly zero, exactly zero celebrities have come out in favor of Israel. It's been a disaster for them. There have been a lot who have come out for the Palestinians of some stature. I've never heard of them, but I know. <laughs> uh, um, who? Yes, the only celebrity that came out for Israel is Joan Rivers. <laughs> Were I Israel, I would probably try to conceal that fact. <laughs> so, uh, those are all arenas. Uh, I don't think it's enough for sure, but it's certainly a place where I think it's good to keep up the fight. Uh, thank you for the work that you do. Um, okay, so my question is about the ways in which we as Americans are financially enabled the killing in Gaza and Palestine overall. Um, with our tax dollars and by supporting companies that regularly support the occupation. What do you, do you have ideas of practical steps that we can take to reverse that? I can make a claim to having original ideas. I've been involved in it a long time. And I think, I'm, I'm, not, a, I'm not at all averse. In fact, I'm very happy to acknowledge, I think there have been a lot of very important victories that have been achieved by the activists in the BDS movement. And there's no question about that. And I would be the very last person on God's earth to in any way want to diminish the significance of those actions, and in particular, the energy, the, the uh, decency of these young people who have given their all and achieved a lot. I do believe, however, that unless you fully situate 
the movement within the confines of international law, you're going to come up against real limits and actually the tactic at some point begins to be self-defeating. So let's take two examples. There was a big battle in Berkeley about a year and a half ago over divestment. And the BDS activists in Berkeley had to end up saying that our resolution has nothing to do with BDS and we recognize Israel and on and on. And the same thing happened recently with the Presbyterian Church. The Presbyterian Church, as everybody in this room knows, it agreed to divest from four American companies involved in the maintaining the occupation. But then what did the Presbyterian Church do? In its resolution, it, enter, it entered a plank that said, this decision has nothing whatsoever to do with BDS. You're just shooting yourself in the foot. You're turning BDS into an albatross. If you just said BDS supports international law in all of its facets, you would save yourself the trouble of trying to convince churches of something they will never, ever agree to, namely the dismantling of Israel. No church group in the United States will ever agree to that. That is just ridiculous. So you would save yourself a lot of trouble and embarrassment. You'd save yourself a lot of trouble and embarrassment by not having the Presbyterian Church say, this resolution has nothing to do with BDS. And then BDS claims it as a victory for BDS. And then you just start twisting your mind into knots. You're claiming as a victory for BDS a resolution that says, we do not support BDS. That doesn't make any sense. There's a kind of dogmatism and radical posturing, which I understand. I was there. I was there when I was in my 20s. I was. So I understand it. But you can't expect a person at my age to repeat what were clear, clearly the errors of my youth. You have to accept where public opinion is and then don't try to push it over the edge because all you end up doing is pushing yourself over the edge into oblivion and irrelevance. Yes. Okay. I'll try to keep this short. Um, I consider myself very ignorant about this topic and I came here for an education, and so I had to pick the juiciest question I could. Um, yesterday I was reading an article that suggested that Israel actually funded Hamas to kind of create division and maybe create the behaviors that they wanted um, Gaza to, to, to have. So could you just explain, if you know anything about that, and explain. Well, that's not a subject, really, of speculation. Uh, it's well known. Any book you read on Hamas, the history of Hamas, every book, every scholarly book, will acknowledge that during the, in the first intifada, during the first intifada, beginning in December 7, 1987, during the first intifada, Israel was some people say financing, but other people will say treating with kid gloves Hamas in Gaza in order to create a counterweight to the PLO back then. So there were far fewer arrests and far less repression inflicted on Hamas during those years 
than was inflicted on the, what was called at the time, the secular resistance movements. As I said, that's not a subject of speculation. Everybody acknowledges it. And the goal was perfectly obvious, to create a counterweight to the PLO. Oh, um, I've gotten old enough to have an idea of, of history. And therefore, I, I look back at the situation and say, well, you know, who's, who actually started this mess? And of course, that is uh, UN and, uh, and England and the United States. And they, they created the state of Israel. And, so, and as you said, that's now a fait accompli. And there's nothing you can do about it. It's law. But what you can, I would think, do now is put the responsibility back on the people who created it in the first place and make them take responsibility and do, and do something about uh, stopping this. As you said, Obama can, could stop it tomorrow without a bit of trouble. I mean, li literally, tomorrow he could stop it. And other places could also. That's so. Well, if the powers that create messes were to accept responsibility for those messes, the world would be obviously a very different place. I don't think that's a realistic possibility. I think it is a realistic possibility if the Palestinians um, find the strength to carry out a united, organized, courageous movement to end the occupation. And if we do our job, I think it is possible to end the occupation. Those are a lot of ifs, and it would take me a long time now to spell out exactly what I mean by that. Uh, I think it's too late in the day for me to do it, and it's something of a diversion. But I still think, um, I think the ball is in the court of the Palestinians which is, if you'll excuse me, and this is not meant, if it were meant, I would say so, but this is, this is not meant as a, um, another criticism of BDS. It's just unrealistic to expect that you can liberate Palestine from the outside. Uh, sometimes you hear spokespersons for BDS speak about what they call, we've reached a South Africa moment. And that's just kind of absurd. Anyone who knows anything about the history of the struggle in South Africa knows that the primary mover, the momentum for change in South Africa, always came from the internal struggle. The sanctions movement, the sanctions movement was important, but it was always subsidiary. The anti-apartheid sanctions movement takes off in 1960 after the Sharpeville massacre. It then reaches another peak in 1976 after the Soweto massacre. It then reaches another peak in 1984 after South Africa, the apartheid regime, imposed the state of emergency in South Africa. The sanctions movement always was a function of and subordinate to the internal movement. No external force can liberate Palestine, and we can play a very useful role, for sure, but first, it has to come from within. I happen to be personally an atheist, I'm not a fanatical atheist. I respect religious beliefs, people with religious beliefs, and there are a lot of very smart people who are religious. So I don't go for this thing of the way liberal secularists carry on as if they're the smartest people in the room, and anybody who believes in religion is an idiot. No, sorry. I mean, I've met a lot of very smart religious people. If you allow me an anecdote, the other day, I attended an iftar in Bay Ridge in Brooklyn, a large uh, religious community. And I met the guy who I hadn't seen in 20 years. He was my laundromat operator. Uh, and he's a very religious guy, religious Muslim. 
very active in the Muslim community, hadn't seen him in 20 years, and I said, my God, Zayn, how are you? Great, wonderful, everything is good. And I had thought actually he had gotten arrested after 9-11 because he had been active with charities trying to support people in uh, Palestine. And in fact, he didn't get arrested. And he had two absolutely beautiful kids. And I asked, so, how is your son, that little boy with the curly hair? He said, oh, my son, he's now on doing rotation. He's a doctor. A doctor, oh, that's pretty impressive. So being a little bit of a chauvinist myself, I think, ah, he probably went to an, I'm, I'll be honest, he probably went to an inferior medical school because this guy runs a laundromat. I said, what happened to his sister? He said, she's right over here. She graduated Columbia, she's going to Albert Einstein Medical School. I said, wow, that's pretty good. He said, I'm a father of six now. I said, six, that's pretty good. He said, what happened? I said, what happened to the third? He said, the third, the third just graduated Harvard and is now going to Cambridge. They, the girls all wear the headscarves, they're all observant Muslims, they're all very smart. We have in the room, but he's probably left, my fav one of my favorite families in the universe, the Al-Aryans. And they're practicing Muslims. Ali, is Ali still here? Oh, okay. Ali, University of Chicago, eldest brother, PhD. Every Al-Aryan, there's I think five. And he told me, Sammy, a funny story. He said, when he was on trial, most of you, I suppose, know the Al-Aryan case. Everyone in his family has a PhD, except one brother. So the prosecutor was trying to turn the jury against Sammy during the case. So he says, Sammy has a PhD. This brother has a PhD. And then it came to another brother, and he said, this one has Two PhDs. Uh, religious people can be very smart. And if we're honest about it, and nobody will be honest about it, in terms of personal morals, uh, they're very much superior to many secular liberals. I would take any Muslim to Bill Maher. Uh, <clears throat> Let me put it this way. I would trust any Muslim with my children sooner than I would trust Bill Maher, and we'll leave it at that. <laughs> um, but leaving aside that, leaving aside that, um, as an atheist, I still say God helps those who help themselves. If the Palestinians don't get their act together, get a coherent strategy, have responsible leaders, uh, people who have moral stature, personal integrity, uh, then there's not much we can do. It's up, in the last analysis, it's up to them. And we can be a support group, but this notion that, so to speak, as I've heard, BDS will liberate Palestine, I think has nothing to do with the real world. So y'all, real quick, we only have five more minutes and we got to start uh, closing up and stuff. We'll still be selling books and Norman will be signing books. Um, on your way out, if you're walking out, there's an email list, uh, folks from Johns Hopkins, Students for Justice in Palestine, for upcoming events and information and stuff like that. Hi. Um, I just read an uh, article that came out in the latest Nation magazine and it was about debunking five of the uh, favorite Israeli talking points. I forget the author's name. Nora Arakat. Yeah. Um, anyway, I was impressed by an argument that was made in there and I wondered what you thought about its uh, cogency in terms of perhaps bringing some more people on board that are kind of not quite with us yet. Uh, and it had to do with international law of occupation. Uh, it, the article was saying that if a, if a people is occupied, that the occupying power actually under an inter international law has different obligations. And this has not been really brought out. And I thought, oh yeah, that makes a lot of sense. But that 
uh, Israel is, by international law, obligated to actually protect the people that are under its occupation instead of bombing the hell out of them. Uh, what do you think of that in terms of an argument that we maybe could use and bring out more with other people here? Well, there are two things. You can make legal arguments which will convince lawyers, and then you can make legal arguments that are going to convince the general public. Uh, Obviously, the legal argument that Israel has responsibilities under occupation, you can make an argument to a general public, namely, uh, Israel has no right to impose a blockade on Gaza, which is causing significant damage to the Gazan economy and also to the Gazan people, not letting medicine in. 95% of the water is unfit for human consumption and so forth. A general public would understand that kind of legal argument. But a general public, even if you made the argument that you propose, or uh, Nora Erekat proposes, a general public wants an answer to the argument, what is Israel to do when rockets are being fired at it? And at that point, you can't just make abstract legal arguments. You have to address a problem which makes sense to a general public. It's not enough to, so to speak, score legal points. You have to address, so to speak, the common sense of the general public and address head-on the problem that's raised. I think sometimes lawyers argue in a fashion that is perhaps appropriate in a brief and perhaps useful in convincing a judge, but may not be as useful or as convincing when it comes to a general public, you have to make arguments that make sense to them. Thank you, I for our time, but I just wanted to address, since it's something you bring up a lot, this question of what is politically possible. And I've heard you before define that as sort of being set by human rights organizations at sort of the outermost space. Um, but many would characterize what organizations like Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International say as advocating for a better occupation. Um, and it seems as if there's, you know, a shift in public opinion about the justification for the occupation itself. So my question is, in that light, do you think that public opinion and what is politically possible is static, or is there room to move that, and are we seeing it move? Look, I totally agree with you on the question of how do you assess public opinion? That's a perfectly reasonable question, because obviously you're not just addressing, to use your word, which I think is correct, you're not just addressing static public opinion. You're addressing also what you might call the subterranean forces at work. They're just below the surface, and maybe you could just push them to the surface and get a little further. I agree with that. But I think you would also agree that there is a difference between some ideas which are just beginning to coagulate beneath the surface and other ideas which don't have a, as the expression has it, a snowball's chance in hell of gathering public support. So you will agree with me, I'm sure, that the idea of presenting to the public let's solve the immigration problem with Mexico by eliminating the border, you would say that goes well beyond an idea just beneath the surface that's on the verge of coming out. That's just fantasy. And so it has no political basis. And so I agree it's a matter of judgment. And you have to have a good sense of what's possible, what's just around the corner, and what's on Mars. And so, when I make my statements about how far you can push public opinion, I look at all of the available data. I asked a simple question. There are 197 countries in the world today 
Can you name me one state, one of the 197, that's even near the point of supporting one state? No, Bolivia is nowhere near. Look at its voting record. I mean, this is just, it's, it has no connection with reality. There's no country on earth that's currently or nearly or approaching the dismantling of the state of Israel. There's none. Okay, that's an excellent question. No, that's an excellent question. Uh, yeah, look, if you, want, if you want to make a rhetorical statement, you can. Okay, I'm, I won't. Now, here's the answer. You said, okay, let's look at the comparison of South Africa. In 1976, Transkei, the first of the Bantu stands created by South Africa, they declared independence formally. It went before the United Nations. Is, is Transkei a state? The vote was 134 to 0. One abstention, the United States. The whole world agreed the Bantu stand scheme concocted by South Africa, had no legitimacy. The UN, 134 to 0, with the one American abstention, declared uh, trans-sky statehood null and void. Okay? Now let's take the case of Israel-Palestine. Every year there's a resolution called Peaceful Settlement of the, South, of the Palestine Question. Comes to the U before the UN every year. Every year, the vote is exactly the same. A hundred, in this past year, the vote was 165 countries. 165 voted for two states on the June 67 border and the just resolution of the refugee question. Six opposed the United States, Israel, Canada, Palau, Micronesia and the Marshall Islands. So if you use the South African precedent as an example, the same overwhelming lopsided majority that declared the Bantustan scheme illegitimate, that same overwhelming lopsided majority declared the two-state settlement legitimate. So if you're using the South African precedent, the only rational conclusion from that precedent is the two states is the best we can go with. That's what the argument tells you. Um, under the theme of what's politically possible and keeping in mind the APAC lobby in America today, um, a couple of weeks ago the Ford ran an article commenting on the fact that the Jewish left is dead. Do you personally agree, yes or no, and why or why Absolutely not? Absolutely not. I think everything I've read and I don't want to be self-promoting, but I wrote a very large book on the subject, tells me that American Jews are either distancing themselves from Israel or falling silent on Israel. You don't see the support. I'll give you an example. Just four or five days ago, I was on a demonstration in New York. Now, I have the authority of age over you. In the 1980s, when you went on a demonstration supporting Palestinian rights in New York, you were, I'm serious, you were taking your life into your hands. It was a very scary thing to walk down those corridors on 42nd Street and chant slogans in support of the Palestinians. It was very striking to me in this demonstration, I saw, and it was a long route, it was about maybe a mile and a half, two miles. I saw one jeweler came out of his jewelry shop um, heckling, and I saw one fellow holding a small sign. There was nothing else. The passerbys, you couldn't see one word, heckling us, attacking us, nothing. 
There are only a few. I'll grant, because I don't want to exaggerate.、Uh, you have to always be objective and observe the facts. There weren't that many who were going like that, supporting us, but there were next to none critical. That's such a huge sea change among American Jews. The fundamental fact about American Jews is they're overwhelmingly liberal.、Uh, during the 2008 presidential election, 80 percent of American Jews voted for Barack Obama.、Well, that's kind of amazing. More Jews voted for Barack Obama than Hispanics. Among Hispanics, it was about 63 percent in 2008. Now, keep in mind, American Jews are by far and away the wealthiest ethnic group in the United States. If they were voting by virtue of their pocketbooks, as most people say people do vote, they should have been voting overwhelmingly Republican. But no, American Jews are liberal. Even though they're the richest, wealthiest ethnic group in the United States, they vote Democratic. Last election, where support for Obama across the board went down, still 70 percent of American Jews vote for Obama. Now, keep in mind, in the last election. The head of state of Israel, Prime Minister Netanyahu, was actively and obtrusively campaigning against Obama, saying Obama was bad for Israel, Obama is bad for the Jews. He was actively supporting Romney, even though head of state of the Jewish state says vote Romney. Seventy percent of American Jews still vote for Obama. American Jews are liberal. Liberal means you support human rights, you support international law, you support international institutions, and it's becoming progressively more difficult, if not impossible, for American Jews to be liberal by their tenets, liberal by their credo, liberal by their beliefs, and at the same time. Lend support to what's cl- plainly a lunatic state, and so you see clearly among young people in particular. And I've been around the block. I've lectured on college campuses for decades. It used to be a war zone. I mean, I remember cases where the students would actually rush me. They didn't beat me, but they made certain I couldn't speak. Nowadays, if you're on a college campus in the United States, let's be honest, because there are a lot of people who like to pose as martyrs to a cause. It's much more difficult on a college campus in the United States today to be pro-Israel than pro-Palestine. I don't envy anyone on a college campus trying to defend Israel nowadays.、Uh, the whole,、uh, the whole atmosphere has changed. And young American Jews, what are they? They're on college campuses. They're liberal. They're idealistic. Give peace a chance. And then you have this crazy state, killing kids, blowing kids to smithereens. Jews don't want to defend that sort of stuff. Now it's not. It's true they're not rallying in huge numbers in support of Palestinians. All the polls show. No, they're not rallying in support of Palestinians. That's correct, but they're not supporting Israel either. A lot of them will stay quiet, because there's a thing in the Jewish community about not airing dirty laundry in public. But in the privacy of their homes, no. Jews do not like to see dead babies and Israel being the executioner. So. Yes, there's been an enormous amount of progress. It's still a tough battle, but we shouldn't diminish the achievements.、Uh, almost entirely owing to the Palestinians、uh, for the changes in public opinion. I think that's it. So, folks, thank you.